The Working Preacher team holds you in prayer during this difficult time. God bless you for all the ways you proclaim the gospel, and may God be with you as you navigate this new way of doing your ministry. We believe that biblical preaching changes lives, and Working Preacher is the most direct way to provide support, encouragement, and assistance to biblical preachers. In this ongoing pandemic, many preachers may feel isolated, but Working Preacher is still there with preachers every week through the podcast and our website to provide support during this time. If you or a preacher you know depends on Working Preacher, both for sermon writing and spiritual strength, now is the time to support it financially. If you are already a sustainer, your increased participation at any level enables us to continue updating this resource to support preachers and lay leaders during this time when they need it most. We cannot keep Working Preacher up to date or even open without the generous support of donors. I am so grateful for your help. Thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for today, May 21st, 2020, which is the Ascension of Our Lord, will be the first chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 11. The psalm is number 47. The second reading is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, and our gospel today is from Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 44 through 53. Uh, just, uh, just a note that this is a uh, podcast we don't do every year uh, for Ascension Day, and if you somehow got here but wanted to uh, find the podcast for the seventh Sunday of Easter, uh, just note that that is elsewhere on the website. So people do a lot of uh, different ways to recognize ascension. Sometimes we pastors will switch out the Easter text, seventh Sunday of Easter text for ascension to acknowledge ascension. Uh, sometimes uh, churches actually have ascension services on ascension day. So, uh, but I'm also wondering this year if we're still in uh uh, and I imagine we will be social distancing, not gathering uh, for, for uh, you know, actually being in, in sanctuaries together. I think Ascension Day could actually be uh, a, a really different kind of experience or opportunity for preachers out there this year uh, to put together an Ascension service. And, uh, and because people, yes, they don't necessarily want to come to church on a Thursday night, but they maybe would uh, attend church in a virtual uh, virtual situation. And so, yeah, Ascension, I think, could be a really uh, uh, unique time this year to think about. It's not, it's, we've talked about this before. It's one of those things that we assume, you know, we say in the creeds, ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, but it, it's, um, it's not, it's only narrated here, of course, and in Acts assumed in the gospel of john throughout the entirety of john but uh this is it, it doesn't have a whole lot of presence in our theological imagination as to what uh what ascension really means for our daily living of faith so i think this is a really i think this is a great opportunity this year for preachers to uh come back to that and help people think about what that might mean it's a big boost for Ascension Day, the COVID pandemic is really going to do things <laughs> for it. You made uh, two puns there, maybe intentionally, maybe not. You kept talking about things that we assume. About oh. So you've got uh, Ascension and Assumption. You've got, yeah, like on. on. It's, uh, it should be an important day for people or an important thing to think about because it's rather important in, in the <laughs> New Testament. Well, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, if, if this were John, it's not, uh, but it, it, it's, for John, it's the ultimate, really, act of Jesus uh, to return to the Father and prepare this abiding place. Uh, but here we have the acts, uh, the actual narration of ascension, and uh, a couple of things that 
that uh, you might want to you know tie into uh, what this means. I think. I think, you know, verse 49 is significant. Uh, well, for, verse 48, right? You are witnesses of these things. And so kind of a one homiletical direction would be to invite people to think about what does it mean to give witness to Jesus' ascension? Uh, what does that look like? And see, I am sending upon you what my father has promised. And I love that because it it carries forward then into acts, uh, right? It's, it's, it's that looking forward to the promise of the spirit. Uh, and then the other verse that I was really uh, struck by this year was verse 53, uh, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. Uh, I love that uh, the gospel doesn't end here. And we know that like theoretically, because it goes on in acts, but that's a, that's a, uh, it's a uh, linear verb there, linear tense. And so they're constantly in the temple uh, praising God. And so there's this unendedness, uh, which I think could be a theme of the ascension, right? This unendedness of, of, God's, of God's reign and God's presence and Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, power <laughs> in, the midst of, um, in the midst of our lives. The um, the ascension is important theologically um, because it completes um, doesn't complete that's the wrong word but let me put it this way in terms of uh, Jesus' work of of salvation and redemption uh, the incarnation by itself is just a misery loves company right that Jesus that that the uh, Son of God takes on human flesh and the human condition. The crucifixion is just mi misery, a lot of misery loves company. And then the resurrection itself by itself is, is uh, the victory of the son of God over death. Um, but you need the ascension that, that, the, the, that then the resurrected Christ makes a way for us back to the father. And, and, and you, that's marked in the creed uh, by the change of the tense of the verbs for people that come from creedal traditions. I mean, just to note, everything's in the past tense, you know, about Jesus, you know, uh, resurrected, um, uh, ascended, now he is, right? And that uh, the resurrection of Jesus is not like the revivification uh, uh, that Jesus did or Elijah and Elisha of raising pe people from the dead. Then those people lived the rest of their lives and died again but that Jesus' uh, life is then eternal and he makes a way for us back to the Father. Uh, so, I mean, um, that's why, I mean, that's one of the reasons why the ascension is so important theologically. And it also, uh, as uh, is uh, evident in, in this text uh, just before then, how uh, Jesus explained to them uh, how to recognize him by uh, going back and looking back and so uh, the witness is, uh, I read, not just as a witness to uh, this moment of ascension, but with Christ's um, ascension, um, we on earth, his followers, become those who bear witness to the promises that are not complete. I mean, the kingdom is come, but it is not, I mean, we still have misery. We still have uh um, we still uh, uh, find ourselves uh, living in less than the promised reign of God's peace and uh, God's wholeness and, and righteousness. And, and so by drawing back to the promises to understand that the scriptures point to Jesus and we become witnesses uh, in light of our encounter with Jesus, um, and that anticipates uh, the return of Christ. So it, it kind of pulls all of those circles together. This is, a, I think, a really important year for thinking about ascension in light of not just the pandemic, but how that's altered the way in which we worship together and the way in which we gather together. Uh, the, the, the question of space is a big deal or place when it comes to the ascension for a lot of people. Where is Jesus now? Uh, well, he's up there, right? Or he's at God's right hand. Uh, those are, we primarily think of those as spatial indicators and a much better way of thinking about ascension is not so much about space, but about 
presence and absence. Uh, you know, it's, it's Jesus is now going to be present in the world in a new way, uh, in a new form. That's really obvious. I think in the two books that spend the most time talking about Ascension and John and then Luke Acts, um, you know, we could have a longer uh, discussion there, but even how he Jesus reorients the disciples in Acts chapter one away from this notion of is now the time to restore the kingdom. Uh, right here, a place the the imagination is a geopolitical reality that they used to have. Is that going to happen now? And his response isn't just it's not a, he doesn't say dumb question. He doesn't say. He doesn't necessarily chide them, but the question is misguided in some way because what's going to break forth now is something they haven't anticipated yet. It's a new way in which Christ will be present among them. And so this for preachers is, well, it's important for thinking about how you're going to preach Pentecost in 10 days time, or if you're looking at Easter seven in a week from now, when Christ will be present now in a different way. And the image is not a new nation. The image is this regathering of dispersed peoples who are brought together. Why is that important? Well, because I think we're working with these ideas of right now, can, how is Jesus present among us in our own dislocated ways? How is the church still gathering in the name of Christ? How is the church still manifesting the gospel in our shared presence, even though that presence is now a really different kind of thing. So I think it just sparks some interesting imagination for asking the question, how will we recognize Christ among us in this new uh, way of being together, a new way of worshiping together that's probably going to last a long time? Yeah, and I think uh, that that's where the question that we get in Acts uh, could be, you know, that could be a direction that a preacher takes of of, of paraphrasing or re, restating that question, uh, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Uh, so it could be something like, people of faith, uh, why do you why do you stand looking for Jesus in the church? Uh, why do you stand? You know, why do you keep looking for Jesus? Um, you know, in a sanctuary, why do you? So some way to rephrase that to get at what you're talking about, Matt, in terms of. In this invitation to see Jesus, to see uh, to see the church, at, you know, outside of its usual uh, parameters, walls in particular, sanctuaries, uh, buildings, but uh, but but throughout, you know, the entirety of our of of how we go about our life. And so that I think that question could be really powerful for people to kind of reframe, rethink about. Yeah, I like the idea of change it, right? Why are you looking for Jesus in a building, right? Or why are you uh, anticipating or, I mean, I get that they're kind of slack jawed by what they're witnessing here, but it's, it's in similar to what we see in resurrection narratives as well, right? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? There's a sense in which you, you've missed the point that the whole order of things is being reshaped right now that looking for your old friend in the old ways and in the old places is no longer where you're going to find him it's now he's ascended into a new life he's was resurrected to a new life uh prior to that and so yeah the ways in which we're tempted to embrace certain forms uh where we think this is this is how we've captured god right this is how we've captured christ's presence Ways that are useful and helpful, those create things like creeds and traditions and spaces and practices, but those all have to be adaptable in some ways to this understanding of, <laughs> of an absent presence, uh, right? And one that's embodied. We'll see more of this from some of the texts coming up really the next couple of Sundays that talk about ways in which the church itself is the bearer of Christ in the world, not the building, of course, but you know, the people. And that that is actually a more powerful image than this idea of just one guy running around Galilee, healing everybody and teaching here and there, that this is, this is not a placeholder in the life of faith. Like just hold on and you know, build an institution for a while and I'll come back and make everything all right. This is the way in which God intends to, um, through Christ, through the spirit, uh, transform the world. I've been, I was trying to look again, and I can't put my finger on it, but uh, I've been doing some work just at recognizing uh, how 
the Gospels as a form of writing is actually a new way of communicating. It, it's not a genre that was already in existence. And it was, uh, uh, this is following the teaching of uh, Amos Wilder, who says that in light of the Christ event, there needed to be an entirely new way of of, of communicating and telling this story. And that's what Luke's begin, uh, Acts um, beginning is. You know, I've, I've gathered all the information. I'm gonna make this uh, um, a, a detailed account uh, for you to know. So this, this uh, train of thought that uh, you've just brought up, you both have just brought up, that how is it that we do in this new setting exactly what Luke uh, was doing in writing Acts, to, to pull together all these details, to communicate it in an entirely different format, in a different space, not gathered together in a sanctuary, but scattered in these communication places where some of us have begun to uh, re reconnect with people across the world uh, through uh, this uh, technology that we you know, we weren't um, in, in, in conversation with. Uh, this past week, I celebrated a birthday uh, with someone and the gathering wound up bringing together literally people from all over the world because Zoom allowed us to do that. And so how do we bear witness to this story? And that's what, uh, Ralph, you're reminding us that the creeds do. They bear witness to this testimony of the God made known in Jesus. And so how do we do that in a new way, um, uh, which, which ties into this new format that the beginning of Acts is saying that Luke is doing for us? Yeah, well, in Acts, it's, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, in, in Acts, there's also a, um, a vulnerability in that. This is a church that's, uh, that's frightened or confused or it's obedient. If you move on to verse 14, you'll see that. But this is a vulnerable group. So it's a really different way of talking about ascension than Ephesians 1, for example, which is largely about power mm -hmm. uh, and dominance in terms of how Christ does that. Uh, Acts shows us a church doing that with utter, an utter inability to imagine what's going to happen next. They just know they've got to sit and wait for a while. Well, and then I, I think sometimes we miss that vulnerability uh, in, in verse 8, which sounds so grand and 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 wonderful uh, uh, that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth and so th these conversations I'm having with uh, preachers now with recognizing that uh, they they don't just have uh, one congregation anymore they're now having these multiple congregations throughout like you said joy like throughout the world of people joining virtually and so this this impact of of witness uh which is which is the promise and charge uh actually that we get in acts but wow that uh, you know it's uh it's it's a it's a fantastic and wonderful thing to think about but like you said matt there's it comes with a lot of vulnerability to imagine that your witness is going to be heard and whatever the response is going to be to that witness especially you know we the, the, especially when the claim is is uh is resurrection the claim to give witness is the tomb is empty and and we know how the disciples responded to that emptiness of the tomb in 24 11. you know that was that's an idle tale that's a bunch of nonsense that's a bunch of garbage and so witnessing is a risky business it's not uh it's it does take that uh, it, it takes us into places that uh, there will be rejection I was just going to say 2411 was the chapter and verse, not the year, as we feel sort of futuristic here. Should we go to uh, Ephesians or uh, to finish that out and then Psalm or Psalm 27 and then Ephesians? I think that introduction um, is right in terms of the distinction between uh, Ephesians, which uh, is... Um, uh, when we remember that the letters are written first, you know, you know there, there is that sense of, of, of celebration, of, of uh, victory, um, but the reality of the re experience that is accounted for that I think you brought up so well, Matt, is that that experience didn't start off 
uh, as as a as a victorious. It it started off as a a big huh. Uh, if, if you can, can communicate that in, 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 in uh, the radio, but um, that, that we, because of that awe, that awe fall moment becomes an awe filled moment. And when we reframe it, we begin to talk about it as it is brought up here, that this is a faith that is, um, we, for which we are grateful and for which we will continue to, to share this good news. And the imagination of Ephesians, uh, in some ways similar to what we see in Colossians as well, is not just this idea of a Christ enthroned over the cosmos, you know, now ruling over all these other inferior powers. It's also then there's an invitation to know that you have access to that same Christ. Um, this is cheating a bit, I realize. You jump to Colossians, for example, that has warnings against people who are trying to supplement their spiritual vitality in other means, as if the author of Colossians is saying, don't you realize where Christ is? And if you are united with Christ, don't you realize then where you are? That uh, Ephesians, uh, the move's a little bit different, but like I said, I'm, I'm cheating here, but that it's not just we have a Christ who's powerful somewhere else, just kind of sitting on his stockpile of strength waiting for the right time, but that there is actually power there available to us because of who Christ is and, and, and the authority that's been granted to him. And that's, that's an important text for times like this and times um, anytime really, but especially for people who are feeling especially powerless in these moments or people who are especially um, beaten down, whether it's physically, emotionally, or economically right now, there's, there's a power in this, uh, well, no pun intended, uh, there's a power in this passage here about Christ's power. In, in oh. Go ahead. In that context, or just a, a, a short sentence, in that context of Ephesians, um, the, the rest of the letter is talking about activities that are on the ground in our life. They're not, you know, it, 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 we, we have all of these questions about behavior, about relationship, about, you know, uh, authorities. And uh, it very much is here now and in the present and not us a pie in the sky by and by. Uh, so uh, while Colossians does that, I think the larger context of Ephesians um, confirms what you're saying as well, Matt. That, yeah, and I think you, you, we get it in kind of subtle ways, but you, but you see that like in verse 19, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? And the sentence could stop there. Uh, it could just end the greatness of his power instead for us who believe. Uh, and then God put this power, uh, th put this power to work. And so it's in these, it's in these phrases that happen after, that occur after the claim of God's power, that it's a power that's for us, that it's a power at work in Jesus for us. And so paying attention to that rhetoric in the letter uh, really underscores what both of you are saying. Saul, do you want to uh, uh, turn us to Psalms? Well, I mean, it's, uh, it, I think the primary um, value of the Psalm on this day, right? It, um, when the, all the attention is on the gospel and acts and the ascension is um, just to note that Israel's view of God as the God of all the nations and enthroned over all of the earth of this cosmic God um, is not new. And so that uh, this is not uh, any sort of new theological claim, nor is, nor is the, um, the sort of humbleness uh, or humility uh, of, of, so the church is tiny at first when it starts to make this claim about God and Israel or Judea is, has been humbled uh, when it's, it really starts to make this claim in the enthronement psalms. Uh, and the enthronement psalms are not royal psalms. People often get that confused. Mm. They're psalms that claim that God is king. And th there's, uh, there's one really powerful verse, which um, it's hard to translate. It's verse 9. So in the NRSV, it's translated, the princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. Uh, that's really... Um, 
the, it's complicated the translation but but notice that it's uh, it's 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 claiming that all of the nations um share in the identity of being the people of Abraham and of course the people of the God of Abraham which is really a remarkable sentence uh to, to occur in the Old Testament and I think you see that uh, that notion of the the, the commonality of, of all people as God's people. And that might, that, uh, um, that's both about renewing our mission, but it's also about a, a way of looking at people who are different from us. I think that's maybe pretty valuable today. And remembering again, that this story uh, that we are moving forward into is the same story that we look back and have come out of.